right, good afternoon. My name is Matthew Gregori. Hi, I'm Susan Park. And our group project for Embrace 2018 was the Hawaii Monarch Butterfly, a study of population relatedness. Going into the significance of our study, you know, the Hawaii Monarch Butterfly are their major plant pollinators. Based on recent studies and articles, there's been a drastic decline in the monarch migration. And our main part of our study is to deduce the evolutionary history of the Hawaii monarch butterfly. And that right there is just a nice picture of the crown flower plant that we'll explain shortly. So a little background into the Hawaii monarch butterfly, or the Danas plexippus. It goes to four life stages, which is the egg, the larva, the pupa, and the adult. The Hawaii monarch butterfly's main food source is the crown flower, or the Caltrophus gigantea. Uh, for our project, we primarily use the, the larva in order for our project because one, it's easier for us to obtain, but also easier for us to catch. Because me and Susan both know it's really hard to catch a butterfly, right Susan? It ain't easy, if you ever try. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's two main types of, of, non um, of monarch groups. There's ones that don't migrate and ones that do. So the monarch butterflies spawn on the islands. We presume that they don't migrate, it was, which leads us into our investigative question. Which is, is the Hawaii monarch butterfly genetically distinct across, within, and outside the Hawaiian Islands? So going into the locations of our samples, uh, we've had multiple islands on Oahu. We've had Leeward, Windward, as well as Oahu Metro and Central Area. And for Kauai, we have Kekaha, Waimea, as well as Ele Ele. Although not depicted, we also were fortunate to have uh, samples from Maui, uh, specifically the Wailua region. Going into our experiment, we had two major hypotheses. Hypothesis number one, that the Hawaii monarch butterfly will show slight genetic divergence among populations in Hawaii. And hypothesis number two, that the Hawaii monarch butterfly will show greater genetic divergence in comparison to the monarch populations outside of the Hawaiian Islands. So from there, we went into our experiment, which we first sequenced and compared the cytochrome oxidase or COX gene in the mitochondrial DNA of the monarch butterflies, uh, utilizing <coughs> techniques such as PCR. We also created a phylogenetic tree of the monarch butterflies based on their genetic relatedness. Because the mitochondrial DNA of the monarch butterfly is so large, we decided to focus on a particular locus of interest, which is here. This is part of cytochrome oxidase 1 and cytochrome oxidase 2. To give you guys a more zoomed up close up version of what we're looking at is uh, this stretch in this uh, locus of interest. So position of 2217, which is about on the tail end of cytochrome oxidase 1, going into about halfway to cytochrome oxidase 2. This is uh, a small portion of the MTDNA genome, giving us about a 1 kb amplicon. So going on into workflow, just to give you a general overview, uh, we start off with the larva or butterfly, mainly larva, which we powdered utilizing um, liquid nitrogen to grind them into a fine powder. We then um, take that purify, uh, powder and we purify it to extract the DNA or mitochondrial DNA. <coughs> We then dilute that DNA to standard concentrations such as 20 nanograms per microliter. We then PCR that using specific primers and then clean up the PCR, leaving the purified or cleaned in DNA which we can send off for sequencing. So as they say in the saying, uh, a, picture shows, a picture says a thousand words. This gel shows a thousand experiences that we had over the course of the summer. So, uh, uh, of the multiple gel, uh, electrophoresis gels that we've run, some of them turned out good, some turned out bad. I want to just a recap of some of the things that uh, was troublesome towards of the of entire experiment. So, some of our PCR samples, we had inconsistent products. If you can see here for K4, which is Kalihi 4, M3, uh, these are locations of where the, our, um, what's it called, our samples came from. So some of the problems was that they either did not show any products of the PCR and the PCR gel, or sometimes they 
we wanted about a 1 kV uh, range, but they were higher than what we wanted. And although they are uh, higher than what we expected, which is the 1 kV, uh, since they were single bands, relatively uh, bright and clear, we decided to go ahead and send it off for sequencing. And just to clarify, those were our PCR cycle conditions for this specific gel. Um, and also, um, going into sending it off for sequencing, since we had a bit of trouble, um, half of our chromatograms were, we found were, some were good, some were bad. About, I'd say, half of the reverse reads were not so clean, while half of the forward reads were clean. So we ended up utilizing maybe around about 700 base pairs, mm -hmm. just to give you, um, to clarify that before going to that. The results. Yes. So from, yeah, this is one of our <laughs> reverse chromatograms. As you can see, lots of peaks and lots of noise and mixed signals. So obviously this would not be resolvable. So from our clean chromatograms, we were able to um, utilize programs such as Mega7 to analyze the data. This is one such data analysis. This is uh, an alignment, so basically um, aligns all the DNA sequences. As you can see here, um, I want you to look at the highlighted columns. This is utilizing, this is showing um, one nucleotide base differences. As you can see that T, C, T, and C there. So this suggests that while they're, uh, they're, they are largely similar, as the non-highlighted highlighted portions are identical, as you can see, there are still genetic variations, although uh, slight genetic variations, which support the hypothesis. Uh, we also wanted to mention that the ones circled over here were utilized from the BLAST database, um, the North America, South America uh, DNA sequences. Another data analysis was the pairwise distance, which helps to measure the um, divergence using a numerical system. So just to kind of clarify how to read this, um, it's going by column and row perpendicularly. So as Kalihi 1 cannot be compared to each other, it would be empty. This would be comparing Kalihi 2 and Kalihi 1, etc. So in looking at the, the numbers here, we see that these are all very small numbers. So again, we see, uh, we see it supporting our, our hypothesis in that there is slight genetic variation depending on the amount, but there are, these numbers are still quite small. Um, the 0000, if you're wondering, just means that they are identical, so there's no difference. So the larger the number, um, larger the difference, smaller the number, less of a difference. And lastly, we were able to create a phylogeny tree of all these samples. Um, this is a great analysis to just show uh, the, the groupings of how similar these samples are. So as you can see here, the Hawaii samples have clustered together near the top, as you can see. And the North America and South America samples have clustered near the bottom, which again supports the hypothesis of the genetic um, genetic variation between these samples. Uh, I will mention that there are outliers, such as the Hawaii sample on the bottom, as you can see, is pretty much outside of all of our samples. Um, the reason we speculate that could be is, you know, Hawaii is small, but it, is there, uh, there's a lot of genetic diversity here. There are a lot of isolated, fragmented populations here, so as we were also doing random sampling, these things can occur. Um, also, another outlier was the Mexico. As you can see, there's a Mexico sample there with the Hawaii clustering. Uh, this, we speculate that this also suggests that the Hawaii monarch butterfly ancestor could have possibly come from Mexico. However, this is still preliminary and we would need to do more research to clarify. Going into our conclusion, back to our investigative question, is the Hawaiian monarch butterfly genetically distinct across, within, and outside the Hawaiian Islands? Both of our hypotheses were supported. The Hawaiian monarch butterfly did show slight genetic divergence among populations in Hawaii. And the Hawaiian monarch butterfly did show um, greater genetic divergence in comparison to the monarch population outside the Hawaiian Islands. 
And with that, we'd like to conclude by uh, addressing acknowledgments. We would like to thank, uh, firstly, Dr. Helmut K for being our principal investigator and for leading us on this journey throughout the summer. His, his wisdom and guidance has been invaluable. We'd also like to thank Dr. Kavi Nepane for also mentoring us and guiding us through all this. We wouldn't have been able to do it without you. Not only them, I want to thank uh, Dr. Krishna Fiorelli, Dr. Michelle Starkey, Dr. Ryan Gerard Kawai, and all the other, individual, other individuals that helped us gather samples and helped us along the way. It was a very eye-opening summer, very, very tough, but you know, we started off as caterpillars, now we're butterflies. <laughs> <laughs> to an extent, you know, take that with a grain of salt. But uh, we, uh, means we can do a lot. So with that, you know, thank you so much for Mahalo. And uh, any questions? No. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Is there any possibility that the monarch butterfly can fly from mainland to here or back? Is that is it possible? Mm. So it's it's hard to say conclusively um, because it's not like we have a you know a ready-made history book of someone saying how they came here. Uh, speculatively, it could be that. Um, since you saw there was a Mexico uh, in that cluster, maybe they could have traveled from the generations from Mexico to here, or it could have been um, traveled on a boat from Mexico to here. It could be numerous options, but th yeah, that could be possible for future research. Anything else? Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, you saw divergence on the nuclear type you know, did you check the proteins to see if they make the same protein or was there a protein difference? Uh, I mean, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Didn't do it, but that would be a nice experiment to do. DNA will result in a protein eventually. Okay. Nucleotide changes occur randomly. Every day, as we live, some mutation happens, but when a nucleotide gets modified to something else, you know. Were the proteins different from proteins that this nucleotide sequence is called? Was the protein difference? Because that will be the key. If the protein was different, then we diverge. Not if no difference, then just a mutation. Yeah. Long story short, my question, you did not study that. Please do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah, honestly, no, I don't know. I, I, I think you just stayed. Yeah. Change difference. Really, it's, it's the, the same, same thing. The same.